Ellen, how are you doing? Thank you for coming out. Um, I'm very excited to be talking with Kimberly Pierce. And uh, I have spent the last couple of weeks reacquainting myself with her films. So I've watched them all back to back in fairly short order. And I have to say it was exciting and exhilarating and elating, but it was also terrifying <laughs> and depressing. <laughs> They're really an intense emotional ride. And I thought maybe the best way so that I'm not alone in this process, I mean, I'm sure many of you have seen her films, but we should um, check out the reel that you were so kind to bring us. So this is like a sample of Kimberly's work and, um, and her working. So let's take a look and then we'll start the conversation. All this feels strange and untrue. So you're a boy. Now what? I'm gonna ask her to marry me. With a shortage of guys and no draft, they're shipping back soldiers who's supposed to be getting out. The other kids, they think I'm weird. I don't want to be. I have to try and be a whole person before it's too late. What happens is I get super obsessed and interested in something that is generally terrifying to me or that I don't fully understand. Action! Are you a girl or are you? Leave him alone! Like this makes any fucking sense? God damn it, how did everything get so fucked up? No! I can't do After you had your pants off, how were you positioned in the back seat? On your back. You was on your back. Now you say you're 21 and you've never had sex before, correct? No. Oh, what a spread of you. When they poked you, when they try to pop it in first at? Say, move your fucking head! Uh -huh. Where? Oh, my God. that marriage was to return the wedding gifts, Thomas? Read the card, shorty! From Steve and Michelle.
can cease fire for a little while. If I concentrate hard enough, I can make things move. There are other people out there like me who can do what I can do. Go to your closet and pray. No. Pray. No! Ah! Mama! You pray, little girl. You no! pray for forgiveness. Mama! next week. You don't have a date already. Maybe you want to go with me. Mama, I've been asked to prom. No, no, no. no. They're gonna laugh at you. They're all gonna laugh at you. Mama, stop it. If the two of you are planning some kind of joke on a poor, lonely girl... Your king and queen are... I wanted to ask you about the figure, the character of Carrie in the context of the, the theme for the Chicago Humanities Festival, which is becoming human. Because something that sort of cuts across your film is the whole question around what is it that we think is human, right? And one of the powers of being human, or the one of the ways that we answer that question is by saying what isn't human, right? And some of these characters really trouble that line for us in various ways. And Carrie is one of those characters. You know, she's timid and weak. She's easily dehumanized. She's bullied at school and at home. But she also has this secret, this power, that makes her different than a lot of other people. So what did you see in this character? What drew you to her? When I reread the novel, I was overwhelmed with uh, our sympathy for her and my sympathy for her, that she was such a misfit, such a social outcast, so uncomfortable in her own home, and I just, and then went to school and had such a hard time and was bullied by the kids at school in a way bullied at home. So I just fell in love with her, kind of the way I fell in love with, with Brandon. Um, and her need for love and acceptance was just so profound. Um, so then I looked kind of outside of that and it was like, wow, her mother has this amazingly ambivalent relationship to her, doesn't even know that she's pregnant or doesn't want to know because it's a sign that she had sex, that she'd enjoyed it. And essentially when the child is born, wants to kill her and only doesn't kill her because she loves her. So it's completely complicated. So that we carry throughout. I thought it was amazing that the powers were her one way of survival. Mm -hmm. So rather than being just a negative, I saw the powers as a positive. They were like any of us having a talent, um, somebody being born wealthy, whatever you have in life that makes things okay for you. It was this thing that she was gonna clutch onto, and that's why she went to the library and was like, oh, I am human, I am normal, even though I have these powers. Or when she was talking to her mom, it's like, no, 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 there's other people like me, and I got it from grandma. She's so desperately trying to prove her own humanity to herself and to her mother, and she's got the kids at school telling her she's not normal, she's not right. She's got her mother at home, beating her up. I mean, I, I think Margaret's justified in that Margaret loves her daughter, but it's kind of just coming in around her, and I love that she, she says, okay, I have powers and I'm normal. And when the most handsome boy in school asks her to prom, which is a disaster, we know she shouldn't say yes. Right. He doesn't her mother like, is right. It's her horrible. mother's <laughs> right. He doesn't like her. She's like, oh, you know what? I have these powers. I'm going to put them away. You're handsome. I'm going to believe that's okay, and I'm going to go to prom. And we're thinking, don't go to prom. So to me, and, and then obviously we can go, you know, we'll talk about it as, as, as we talk more, but that basic setup is just so wonderfully combustible. I mean, Stephen King writes a classic novel that's timely, timeless, more relevant today than it was then, and it's just, it's so rich, and then it's a Cinderella story turned on its head. So I fell in love with the novel in rereading it. One of the ways, or one of the things that distinguishes your film from Brian De Palma's is this kind of notion of it as, I mean, it's, it's a genre film in that it's a horror film, but it's also kind of a superhero origins film, and then a revenge film, a teen pick, it's all these different things. But, so it's sort of more about 
thinking about her as a superhuman in a way, but also you really humanize the characters in a way that I think they don't get that same kind of treatment in De Palma's film. Carrie is more complicated and interesting, but her mother, Margaret, I mean, all due respect to Piper Laurie, I mean, that figure became kind of a pop cultural caricature, you know, the dirty pillows and get down on your knees and pray. Um, and in this film, in, in your film, something very different happens. I mean, is that a way of contending with what you said in the reel, that you're drawn to things that terrify you, things you don't understand, that attempt to kind of humanize? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so for me, it was like I faced the possibility of taking Margaret and making her very broad, right? Um, but then I thought, okay, well, if I, if I make her broad, there's gonna be something missing for me in the way that I work. So I thought, how can I make sense of this woman who, as I have in the opening of the movie, she gives birth to this thing, she wants to kill it because it reveals her desire, which is just like John and Boys Don't Cry, right? We kill the thing that reveals us, our intimacies. And I thought, and how can I make her not somebody to hate and laugh at? Because if you hate and laugh at her, right, you kind of discount her. I mean, and it's, it's great to laugh at characters, but if you're not gonna laugh at them, you gotta identify with them. And I thought, well, how do I identify with her? Well, I have to make sure that she always wants to be a good mother. And that was really interesting to me. So if she's terrified of what Carrie is, she's terrified of her own sexuality, she's terrified of the world, but she wants to be a good mother, well, then I'm always gonna be engaged. And so th those were some of the things we worked on. That's why when she says, get in the house, Carrie's like, I'm not going in that house because the house is where Margaret beats Carrie. She doesn't, Margaret doesn't like to go outside the house, but she won't beat Carrie outside the house mm -hmm. because in the 70s, you could beat your kids and probably get away with it publicly, but you can't now. So it was like we were facing... <laughs> Sure, the law will come down on so you. One of the, will. the realest parts of the, the film. <laughs> but, but it was actually, interestingly, even if you went for camp and you went, you'd have to go very camp nowadays to be beating a child outside the house and for it to work. So reality does seep into our movies, right? So, so then we were like, well, let's go in the direction of the house is where she has control and she beats Carrie up. She would never beat her up outside. There are rules. They both know it. Um, we brought in from the book the fact that she scratches herself, she punctures herself, because these are ways that she deals with her own feelings. She does beat her daughter in the house, but as Julianne will tell you, she'd much rather beat herself, right? So she's, again, Julianne was like, Kim, if I just beat the shit out of her in the house over and over and over, I'll be a caricature. So how do we ground it, have her hurt herself more? She's only then hurting her daughter when this wasn't enough and to get her in line. The other thing we tried to do was make the religion, interestingly, believable, but not rooted in a real religion. Because if you made it a real religion, you were mocking a real religion, right? In the 70s, it was interesting. I think that you could do these broad versions of religion because I don't think people had seen religion a lot in the culture, in the pop culture. And this is something Julianne and I talked a lot about because she had just done the Sarah Palin film, so she right. was very aware of it. It was like, you, it's very hard now to represent religion in a broad, farcical, comical way because you run the risk of making fun of somebody. Well, if you don't want to make fun of somebody or some religion, you got to walk a very fine line when you represent religion. Because that was not my intention. I'm like, I don't, I'm not anti-religion. Well, it, puts, it would put your film in a particular political context too, right, that you may not want. Right, so if you pick the, I'm half Jewish, half Catholic. So it's like I've been bat mitzvahed and baptized and, and I, I spent a lot of time in the Middle East, so it's, I, I'm fascinated by religion, right? And I, and I have a lot of respect for religion. Mm -hmm. So yes, the last thing I wanted to do was turn Carrie into something political. I mean, if Carrie had been political, I would have made it political, but it was not political, yeah. and it certainly wasn't anti-religion. So how do you then represent religion in such a way that it works as a story gear, but you're saying, guys, I'm not interested in getting into a religious debate about Carrie because there's no real debate to be had. Does that make sense? So then we have to make it really clear, oh, Margaret is religious but it's her own religion that it's she's her made up. Yeah. Yes, it's yeah. her that she's made up, and it's really important that she's fundamentalist in her own terms, but I'm not looking to point the finger at any particular religion. These are really weird, complicated things, tight ropes to walk as an American filmmaker, coming, making an American movie where you're judged in a lot of different weird ways. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I mean, it's still Jesus on the wall in the, the closet. It, We're it, still it, it is Jesus it. de facto because what else do you, and this is challenging, 
what else do you put up there to represent religion? So if you want to represent religion generally, and you want to represent that she's made her own religion, could you do it without any Catholic or Christian icons? Probably not. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to put Islam up there. That'd be really weird for that woman, right? So yes, is there technically an error that I have Jesus up there if she's making her own religion? Well, you could say yes, but you could also say no. You could say she started out believing in Jesus, and then she went off and believed in whatever she believed in. You are interested, though, in like real life stories, in real world events. I mean, the story of Brandon Tina, or looking at stop loss policy in the US military around the Iraq war. In the case of Carrie, there isn't necessarily that real life story, but the context that everyone is given it, well, yeah, you've talked about one or some, but um, is sort of thinking about bullying, which yes. is something we talk a lot yes. about, but also school violence. Absolutely. I mean, we're in a school right now, and that, Absolutely. you know, sort of, how much were you thinking about those issues, and were you thinking about particular episodes of violence? Or Absolutely. So I was thinking about all the bullying. I mean, I actually did a lot of research on contemporary bullying, and I was horrified at what kids are doing to kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, I, I almost don't want to drive traffic to it, but I'm going to talk about it generally because of the outcome. There were two girls who, I don't know if you read about this in Gainesville, these girls were horrible. They made a video of themselves using the N-word over and over and over and over. I don't know if you know about it. And it is, I, it, you're embarrassed to watch it. You know it's terrible. But you watch it as a filmmaker because you want to be informed. The amazing thing was it went viral and they got kicked out of school and almost kicked out of the town. So that was interesting to me. So I went around and I interviewed principals and teachers and I said, if I was going to add a, a level of credibility to this and ground it in the way that I like to do. Tell me all your stories. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting was, because I said, how do I make this feel right now versus even three years ago? And they said, well, one, the cell phones, that the kids are videoing it, they're photographing it. Well, that's just the thing in our life that I find amazing, which is we may have an experience. And how often do we then say, oh, let me, let me videotape myself. Let's take a, a selfie. Let's upload it. You upload things, they get downloaded. That means that they maximize. So I was like, OK, well, that's just contemporary culture. But the new thing is that the bullies are having ramifications to the stuff that they do. Mm -hmm. That when their videos get out, people have a response. And that's where you know, I wrote that scene with the teacher, which comes out of a, a, a King scene, but that we completely modernized. So that was where it was kind of, wow, you can see the culture kind of seeping through the movie. And that stuff excites me. Because it's, at the end of the day, I want you to go to Carrie and have a great time. You're not going to be in the mindset that you are for Boys Don't Cry and Stop Loss. And I don't think you should be. But I can't help but want to reflect the reality in our culture. So the, certainly the bullying was important, and certainly the, the social media and the social media getting out there. The other thing was, I thought, can I make this any more painful than the blood dump? <laughs> right? <laughs> the blood dump's bad. Right. What's worse? Having the cardinal sin of them bullying you and filming it put on those screens. So. You know, one of the things about our culture, and you've sort of just nodded to it in what you just said is this kind of fascination with violence, something that we abhor, but we're drawn to it and we'll watch it. And you've talked about your own connection to violence, that you are anti-violence. You know, Stop Loss is an anti-war film, or that's how you understood what you were making. But you write about violence, you make movies all about violence, extreme violence, you know, bodily harm, intense bodily harm. And I'm curious what your attraction is. Is it just this is the culture I live in, and I'm curious about that. Is it personal? Is it political? Is it more theoretical? I think it's all of it. I think it's personal. I think it's very personal. It's very political. It's very historical. And I think, uh, given the way I was brought up, uh, have seen violence, have been around violence. Um, in your family? In the world, in my life. Um, and in particular, what's interesting to me is as I've continued in the world, it wasn't just that I saw it at a certain age. As I've continued in the world, what's troubling to me, but very truthful, is I think life is, life is political. I think people are violent to one another at school. I think they're violent to one another in their homes. I think they're violent to one another in their jobs. And I think that that takes many forms. It takes emotional abuse. It takes physical abuse. It takes verbal abuse. There are power plays. We watch shows that are about power plays. Um, that's just human life. It's the human condition, right? So for me, as a dramatist, 
I go for energy and I go for pulse, right? I go for where's, where's, the good, where's the strong protagonist, where's the strong need, where's the strong obstacle, what's a good scene? A good scene generally has violence in it. Yeah. It just does. And so if I'm drawn to these things, maybe because I saw them when I was younger, I'm drawn to it, but I'm not that age anymore. So it's also that I'm seeing it in the world and I'm like, wow, this is what the world is like. It's not all of our life, but there's a big part of it. So particularly with Boys Don't Cry, when I read the story of Brandon and Tina, I fell in love with Brandon and I felt like I adopted a child and I had to protect Brandon. Well, the only way to protect Brandon, and I say this in, in the real, is I look at things that terrify me. So when they raped Brandon over and over and over and killed Brandon, I felt terrible about that. I was sad, but I also thought, well, I have to have the courage to go and understand that if I'm gonna make a movie about it and if I'm really gonna ever have any chance of engaging with it. So as much as I hated the violence, I thought it was my obligation to know it inside and out. And the way I know something inside and out is like an engine. I put it together, I take it apart. How do you do that without, because I know you've talked about this, you don't want to, and in fact, in making Boys Don't Cry, you were frustrated or, you know, you realized that this was a narrative that had been sensationalized in a way and really focused on the crime. So when you're making a film and where there's a necessary level of violence to create that kind of engagement and connection you're talking about, how do you do that without falling into something that sensationalizes? Or? You, you know that you probably will fall into something that's sensational. Like, I think you just accept that. I think your heart has to be in the right place. I think you have to be really good at what you do and a trained professional. So it's like if you're going to put things together that could create a bomb, you need to know that, right? You may, you're going to aim one way, it may become a bomb, right? So you have to know. And by bomb, I don't mean a failure in the, at the box office. <laughs> I mean a bomb that could explode. So I think that you, you acknowledge that what you're doing is tricky, and I think you walk into it knowing that you could fail, and that at some point along the way, you may fail, and you bring up something great. So for instance, when we cut together the rape of Boys Don't Cry, I have a huge tolerance for violence because of the personal, because of the political, because of all of it, because of having spent a lot of time studying that going to the murder trial. I could watch that rape scene for quite a long time until I feel something, right? Well, we go and screen the movie, and you know the cards are coming back, and I'm not noticing, but Christine is noticing. People are having a little bit too much of your rape scene. And I say, yeah, but Brandon got raped all night long. I mean, this is like a five minute rape scene. What, they can't deal with this? Mm -hmm. That's my immediate feeling as the artist and as the person who wants to honor Brandon. Then I get to laying in bed thinking, Maybe I'm not honoring Brandon if I'm honoring my own appetite and ability to withstand violence, but maybe the masses, it's like I'm doing something to them that is not taking them into the story. It might actually be taking them out. So what we yearned for, and we recut that rape scene, I think we screened it at least eight times. We wanted to get to the point where generally, because you can't satisfy everybody, but generally people watched and didn't look away, right? Because let's say I did create the explosion bomb, right? Mm -hmm. I did create something pornographic, I did create something sensational when I only took my own temperature. And now think about it. People say, but you should make art for yourself. But not if you're actually, I don't think you make art for yourself. I think you make art in collaboration with an audience. And I don't think you make it just for the audience. I think it's this weird relationship that you form. So I think that that rape scene is, is, is the collaboration of me and the audience. If it was just for my viewing pleasure, it would be more violent. There's a, it's a kind of incredible to me, I was thinking about that, watching Boys Don't Cry, the way you convey that this is, happens to Brandon all night long repeatedly without actually showing that. It's, it's clear as day. Um, but I want you to know that, but I don't want you to turn away. And right. if I thought I could pour more violence into the scene and you would stay tuned in as a population, it would be more violent. So that was the, it was like I went too far and I pulled back. But it's something so interesting about your films and the way you depict violence that is not just about the thematic, um, but the way you actually stage a scene, what you were talking about earlier. Um, there are scenes in Boys Don't Cry, also in Carrie, where you have a room, you know, and often it is the domestic space, and these bodies are kind of circulating around each other. Like it almost becomes abstract at a point, and the violence surges, and you know, then it kind of slows down and you're not sure, you know that things aren't going to go well, like don't go to the prom, right. Brandon, don't go back into Lana's house, you know. Yeah. But I'm just so curious about, I, I don't know quite how to put the question, but it's physical, right? You're waiting for that physical explosion, but what's happening in that room is both physical and something much more. And 
you know, you've made a lot of films about violence. You've talked to people who experienced violent events. What have you learned about um, what violence is, how it operates, what mo you know, like what motivates it, and maybe even how we should respond to it? Well, I think what I said before about life being political, I think that, I think human life is violent. I just, I think it's, it's an unfortunate thing that I kind of thought maybe that could go away. I don't think that's going anywhere, but I think violence, you know, I think all violence is dangerous. I think that if you verbally abuse somebody, you can hurt them the same way you can physically hurt mm -hmm. them. I mean, you might even hurt them more. I think intimacy is violent. I find that people who love each other want to hurt each other, to prove themselves, to know themselves, to get closer. Um, I think that, I just, I think the violence is part of us. I don't think it's about cleansing it out of us. I think it's, particularly as a dramatist, I think it's just continuing to explore why we do it. I mean, that's why Carrie was so interesting to me. Like, and, and one thing I feel, I think, excited about is I try to put more dimension into Chris, even though I think the, the, the Chris and the Palmas movie is fantastic. Nancy Allen's great. So yeah. it wasn't about, let me do better. It was, I mean, I think that in many ways, I try to design a Chris who is a wounded girl underneath it, but who's the queen bee and has a lot of power. And I try to design it that she has all the power in the school and she's used to the misfit being the underdog, right? So she's used to her being under her, her shoe, right? When the teacher, when her father, when her best friend starts to help carry, Chris takes it as a personal affront. Fuck all of you, you guys are taking my power away. I thought that was interesting, right? And then she's got, well, if you're gonna take my power, I'm gonna get violent. Right, so that we're all in this kind of nexus, this communion together, and that's why we have to have violence. Well, and it's the structure of violence too, right? Or the structure of power, because it, all of your films are these characters who want to, or even not through their own like intention, upset that order. What is the order that we've imposed or the hierarchy? And then there are people who really, really want it back in place. Someone like John in Boys Don't Cry, or you know, that's something that or is Chris. playing or Chris yeah. and Carrie, or between um, the two main characters in, in Stop Loss, Channing Tatum wanting to go back. And well, yeah, that's very perceptive of you to say, because I did a lot of interviews with soldiers, and I met a number of soldiers who were just wired for violence. At, yeah. at a certain point, they had gone, and it wasn't about politics, it was just about, they loved being close to the other men, which obviously means that there's maybe something in society we're not allowing men to be that close because these guys were like loving, I love living with him and I love the community. And when they came back to the States, they were just wired to go back. Yeah. Something about the combination of the violence and the community with the other men was what they needed. Even when I, did, when I went around the country, particularly around here in the Midwest, I met a lot of wounded warriors, guys who'd lost their limbs. And they would say to me, I was like, what's your biggest regret? They're like, that I can't keep fighting. Not that I fought and I lost my limbs, but that I'm not well enough to go back. And I was like, wow, there's something we're providing them in that crazy environment that is feeling alive to them. Yeah, which they can't fully exercise here. I mean, as violent as our culture is, right? I mean, to me, watching Stop Loss, you're looking at men who, as much as you empathize with them, and you know, this is a movie that's all about how screwed they are by this policy, they're also like these kind of walking, you know, they're killing machines. Yes. That's what they've been trained to do. Yeah. And they walk among us like yeah. zombies, you know. Well, and we've only Im improved the ways that we turn them into killing machines. Yeah. But now there's a whole post, there's a, there's a market after that. After you're a soldier, you could enter Blackwater, which is now XE. Like you can, you know what I mean? If you, if you have an appetite for violence, it's out there. And if you don't get it stoked by doing a job that gives you that violence, we're seeing it spill out into the society. I mean, it's... Violence is just out there. So it, it feels to me it's, it's just an inherent part of, of so much of life. And not that I want to perpetuate it. We talked about that. My, my nightmare would be that I would ever do something that would encourage the violence. So that's why I say it is possible that I make something that airs. And then I have to put it out there and screen it. And I have to, that's, we were talking about this back there. One has to be so honest with oneself about one's failings so that one doesn't continue to repeat them. Um, well, we can talk more about failure. I want to ask you a little bit about actors. I mean, speaking of Channing Tatum and Ryan Philippe in Stop Loss or Hilary Swank, I mean, and we should just pause to reflect that Boys Don't Cry started as your graduate school film. Yes. And went on to win Hilary Swank 
a Best Actress Oscar, you know? I mean, it's just incredible what that film did and the kind of conversation it opened up. But so, uh, actors must be incredibly important to you in sort of thinking about how to make these real world stories into entertainments in a way that we can connect to and really dig into. So, how do you find the actors that you work with? Finding actors is one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. It took three years to find Hillary. And that, I'm not exaggerating. I was in, I was in my first year of grad school and I was writing this script and I was in love with this person, this character. I had been to the murder town. I knew everything about Brandon. And I was just having all these you know, calls looking for Hillary, uh, looking for, for Brandon. And interestingly, back then, you know, queer culture, gay, which wasn't called queer culture, it was called gay culture. Gay culture was very repressed. And that was a small movie. Mm -hmm. So not that boys changed it, but the world kind of changed when Hillary won an Oscar because movie stars, powerful people in Hollywood did not do small films. Just, it wasn't the, the norm. So you weren't gonna get big actors. Also, because gay life was kind of hidden, people didn't really wanna play too many gay parts because it could hurt your career. I mean, they're crazy, right? When you look back. Um, so for three years, we couldn't find the girl. We had uh, girls coming in who couldn't be masculine. We had uh, butch lesbians and, and transgenders and drag kings who I was friends with coming in who were wonderful, but didn't necessarily, couldn't carry the whole role. Um, so we kind of had these two camps and then Ellen came out, we got more people. It was only at the last minute that I just said, we're about to shoot this movie and we don't have this person. <laughs> You know, and Christine Problem. was like, we'll find, we'll find the person. And I was like, well, you don't even understand. We, you know, I knew you needed somebody who, who was kind of amazing. So we had all these tapes coming in and late one night a tape came in. And it wasn't that she was already Brandon. It was, what I, what I realized was that most of the girls coming in when they tried to be a guy, they got very serious, right? <laughs> Hillary smiled. She was warm. Well, that was ultimately a transcendent moment of, well, why did Brandon have so many girlfriends? Why did Brandon get invited into people's homes? He did something for people. There was some kind of rapport. There was some kind of warmth. There was some kind of charm. And that's what she touched. It wasn't the passing as the boy. That was going to come later. So that was, she was a, really a, a, an amazing find. And then we did great work together. I had her live as a boy for six weeks. Um, we just went deep, deep, deep into the character, but we always held on to that charm. And whenever we went away from it, we kind of lost the character. So that was extraordinary. I mean, I, I could jump around with Channing. This was amazing, and I want to be sensitive to how I talk about masculinity, but America doesn't make many men in terms of stars, okay? So by that I mean, I'm doing a casting session, and there are no movie stars in, in the, his age range. Not really. There was Heath Ledger, but he wasn't gonna work, and he wasn't that uber male. Mm -hmm. But in that young 20-year-old, 20 23-year-old age group, when I was casting, there's no movie stars. Okay, so if there are no movie stars, that means you gotta go out and find somebody, right? And it means you have to find somebody who has a huge amount of charisma, has enough acting skill to carry the scene and carry the movie. So all these young guys were coming in, and I would send the tapes you know, to my brother, and he was like, oh, he's like a pussy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, he's not a pussy. And he's like, you better not cast a fucking pussy. And I'm like, I'm not going to cast a pussy. And he's like, you, you need to do this right. And I'm like, I know I need to do it right. I mean, <laughs> this is my job. Um, and we're fighting a war, which I feel terrible about. So the last thing I want to do is go and do a movie where the soldiers come and say he's a pussy. And your brother was fighting in those wars. Yes, and my yeah. brother was fighting. So I felt this huge obligation because of the films I make and also because I've got this brother who is out there. Um, and so it was very interesting. I was like, no, 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 no. These guys, they, I just, I had met like the soldiers and have you guys met like professional NFL players? Yep. Yeah, it's like that. These guys were like, I'm like, my God, they're superhuman. They're huge legs, huge muscles. Like you don't fake that, you know? So in, in comes this guy Channing, who is not anybody then, right? I mean, it, when I say not anybody, he's somebody in his life, but he wasn't famous. <laughs> I could just see Don't that. Don't dehumanize Channing. There's going to be an article. America's sweetheart. Kim Pierce says that Channing was nobody. <laughs> and I'm not, what I'm saying is, and I have to be careful. So I have to be kind of self-conscious in our business. Does he mean something foreign? Right. right? He wasn't a recognizable product at yes. that point. Yes. Can you, can you cast him and sell the movie? So he wasn't at that point yet. Um, 
But I saw, my God, this guy is really hunky. You know what I mean? This guy is like muscular. This guy is handsome. This guy is like these guys. So, you know, I, I watch him act, and he's quite good. Um, and I say, well, what else can you do? Because I'm like, I've got to sell him to the studio. What else can you do? You know, and he does a break dance in my office. Oh, so you knew about his dancing skills already. I knew about his dancing skills. Then we saw him and the he's utterly, he's engaging, he's charming, he's a guy, he wants to go running, you know. So that was an interesting <laughs> case, yeah. And I was like, no, we, we don't have to go running. But <laughs> <laughs> he said, I want to be in this movie, I'll do anything. And I said, that's great, you're going to have to do anything. So <laughs> I, you know, I called up the powers that be and I said, look, this guy's great. And they're like, but he hasn't really been in anything. Anything. Not, again, he's been in some things, but he hasn't been in the things that I need. Um, so they said, just fly, we'll fly, he'll, he has to fly himself to New York, um, but you work with him for six hours and you make a tape. And, and I said, great. And this was, uh, I want to give credit to Scott Rudin, because this is my producer saying, make a tape, I'll look at it. If, it's, if we can get him there and I can sell it to the studio, I will. So we did this tape and he's great. I mean, we got, the, we got the performance. It wasn't just the muscularity and the charisma, but we got the performance in. The sweetness. He has that, like, brand. Well, he has the sweetness. That's one thing you'll probably see of every actor that I cast. They all need love. <laughs> they need it. I mean, we all need it, but they project it. That yeah. there's a, there's, there is a warmth that you will probably find in every person I cast because I need it. And I always find if he's going to be a killer, same thing with Peter Sarsgaard. You know, when I met Peter Sarsgaard, he didn't scare me. And I said that to him. I was like... You don't scare me, and if you don't scare me, you don't get the job. You have to scare me because you have to be a killer, because he was like this beautiful Mississippi boy. I mean, I made him put on 15 pounds. We dyed his hair. I mean, so these killers, Channing and Peter, they have to be, and it's not intellectual. I feel it. They have to be the warmest, nicest people because I'm going to make them monsters. Now mm -hmm. we get into the, the animals. I'm going to turn them into an animal, but you have to love the other side of them. So you'll see that in anybody that I have be ruthless. We'll get to Julianne in a minute. So Channing did the tape, Scott Rudin went to bat, and this is probably a testament to, to the power, this is a, a very powerful uh, Hollywood producer, is a testament to his power that he can get a studio to cast somebody who, when I say doesn't have, they don't have what we instantly say, oh, I can sell that to a huge population. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to cast him, um, and I'm very proud of that. Um, Julianne, if we want to talk about casting, so you have somebody who's going to scratch herself, cut herself, put a knife on her daughter multiple times in the movie, and literally fight to the death to kill her daughter. And you don't want it to be broad, you want it to be grounded, right? Who do you need? You need somebody who has movie star charisma. You need somebody who's ultimately in their heart and soul, because at, at the end of the day, that's what the camera gets, is oozing a level of humanity, a level of sweetness, so that I get then both sides. I get the killer in her, she will kill her daughter, she will kill herself, but you get the lover in her. So that to me, now that's, now you talk about what I love. I love actors, I love them. I mean, I love writing, it's, it's good. I love shooting, it's great, but I love actors because actors are, they're everything. They're my, they're my thing, they're me, but I can't do it, right? Right, right. Well, um, I want to, um Actually, I have time for one more question before I go to you guys. So um, how often do you get to do what you want? I mean, you make films <laughs> that are challenging. They're not what Hollywood is making, you know, and you've got, like, even in just describing to get Channing into your film, which is like an ensemble film in a way, right? Every one of those soldiers is really important, and their yes. family members yes. are important to really understand what's yeah. going on and how these kinds of decisions are negotiated, right? And the impact they have on a community. But so what do you have to do in order to be able to get the actors you want? Do you always get the actors you want? Nope. How do you get your movies made? Um, you, you prostrate yourself before <laughs> fate. <laughs> you get in the closet and you pray. <laughs> no, actually, you take a few bullets <laughs> and some knife wounds. Um, what do you do to get a movie made? The simple answer to that is, you fall in love with an idea, you fall in love with a character, you fall in love with a story. That's already hard, right? There's a lot of stories out there, a lot of things take your interest, you have to sit with it for a little bit of time to figure out this is the one that's worthy of a movie. So that's already takes a lot of time. Then you've got to get a script written. 
So I'm not a bad writer. I might write a draft. I'll bring somebody in. They'll help me. We'll rewrite it together. You got to get a script that tells your idea. That takes time. That can take money. Um, then you got to get out there and you got to get somebody want to make that movie. They may want to make it for X amount of money and you may say it needs 2X, right? And then that's when you got to start taking the bullets. Then you're begging, 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 and then maybe you're going to get half of what you need. Okay, so you're already never going to get as much as you actually need to do it, right? That's like, we're going to do an interview, but she gets a chair. I don't. We're going to do an interview. We get one microphone. Okay, make it work. Mm -hmm. you're, you're trading it back and forth. That's the reality of my job. You're never going to get all the resources you need, but you're going to get something. And if you're desperate to tell that story, you're going to keep going. Okay, so now I have a budget that's probably 60% of what I really need, but I secretly know if push comes to shove and you put a gun to my head, I know how to share that mic with you. I know how to do it without this table. Damn, I know how to do it without the, the table and the chairs. And we can, we'll stand in front of you and we'll scream. You know that that's your, you always know at the end of the day, if they took everything, what can you make it with? Then you go out to cast. I don't know if people realize this, but you know, we have about, if we're lucky, two months to cast. Well, that means who's available in the world at that, who exists in the world to play those roles, right? In the Channing case, there were no movie stars. Mm -hmm. Thank God there was Channing, because if it hadn't been Channing, there was nobody else out there that, who could have played that role. So that's a miracle that I found him. Then you got to convince them to cast him. Then you go to the other roles, Joe Gordon-Levitt. Fantastic, I fell in love with him. We just kept working together, working together. He wasn't going to be the lead for various reasons, um, but he's brilliant. How mm -hmm. could I let this guy go? So I think, oh my God, he could be Tommy. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm embarrassed to even ask him to be Tommy. It's not a big enough role, but I love him. So I say, Joe, I love you. Would you be in my movie? He's like, I'll do anything for you. I go back, I rewrite Tommy, right? Because it's, it, it, it's not good enough to have somebody of that talent not on screen longer, so I expand the role. I want the girl. I want a great one. That role's not really big enough to get somebody who's great, but there's a woman named Hilda Queeley who represents all the best a lot of the best actresses. Um, she and I, she sent me to have uh, a sandwich with a guy named Daniel Craig years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm living in Malibu. I'm like, sure, Hilda, I'll, I'll go out with Daniel Craig. So I go and have sandwich that, with this gorgeous guy who's just been, you know, in a small film. And I mean, you have a lot of relationships. You have a lot of friends in Hollywood. And, you know, you meet somebody, you know they're great. So Hilda says, Kim, I love your movie. I, yeah, I adore you, and I think you should meet with Abby Cornish. Well, I almost fainted because, of course, Abby Cornish was, I had seen Candy. That's a movie star. Your mic just uh, went. I had seen Candy. <laughs> That's a movie star. So my heart was, of course I would want Abby Cornish. My role's not big enough, right? Hilda sends Abby in. Abby wants the part. I'm shocked. I expand the role. So basically, I would just say, it's a, I could tell you a million anecdotes like this, it's this, if this is the ideal scenario, you always know in the back of your head, let them take it all and I'll stand up there naked. Like you, you always know at the end of the day what you have to do and then there's not enough money. Maybe you get the wrong actor. You know what happens if you get the wrong actor? You make it work. Mm. If you get somebody who maybe isn't as charismatic as you need, maybe they aren't really the star, but that's what you need because this movie's going now and if it doesn't go now, it's never gonna get made. You get in there and you say, well, I took, I mean, I studied acting for three years, not to be an actor, but to be a director, and you say, I'm gonna make this person a star. I'm gonna do it. You have to do it. And you know that if you don't make them a star and they fail, the reviews are gonna say, God, they, why did they cast that person? That person isn't good enough, whatever. But at a certain point, you just say, I don't care, I'm gonna get to the finish line, and I'm gonna make the best of every single thing that's given to me. And that is the only attitude you can have. Well, um, I would love to hear from you as well, so. I'm going to bring the lights up a bit. There are microphones. Oh. We'll do a minor adjustment. So yeah, hands in the air. Hi. Hi. Um, so in your version of Carrie, I see that you um, made Carrie very excited to have her powers, and she was much more in control of them. And, but then I thought by the time you get, she gets to the prom, where she's actually sort of conducting um, and she's very in control of what she's doing, that it raises the question of that she becomes a little sadistic because she is very much in control of hurting all these people. So how did you balance that and deal with that? Uh, that's a great, great point. I would take uh, argument with, I think, yes, she enjoys her powers because as I said, I think that her powers are her savior. 
for her chance to have something special in the world. But I would actually say what I try to design, and maybe I, I didn't do it well enough for you, is that she doesn't have control of the powers. It's specifically why in the book scene, and I spent a lot of time, that was all done with CG, and it took many, many rounds to make sure that the books go up, she gets excited, and then they start flying around. So it was really important to me that she had exploration and curiosity, but not mastery. Also, there's another beat I add in the prom, when Tommy is hit by the bucket. So, so what happens is she, she gets humiliated, the powers start to leak out. She's like, I gotta get the hell out of here. We shouldn't use the F word, right? I know, I did already. I know, but I do a lot. And They'll bleep you if they need to, yeah, so okay, feel free. Good. Anyway, so I'll try not to. So, anyway, she's got to get the hell out of there, right? I, I've, I've done my TV versions. Um, so she's leaving, Tommy gets hit, goes down, she comes back. She's the queen, that's the king. It's grief, right? So she's leaning over her stricken king, and she looks out at them, and she's angry, but it's the grief over losing Tommy. It's not her own grief. And that was the trigger for me. That was important. Then she only goes after the culprits. Yeah. There, there's going to be casualties, but she's like, you got me. I'm going to get you back. I'm going to get Chris's posse. Um, the movement of the arms, I mean, that was, that's not that she has such control. That's that she has some control. In fact, what I really strive to do in a post-Columbine world was make you love Carrie as a child, because she is a child, which I think is unique. Um, make you understand that she wanted powers to save herself, make you understand she didn't want to hurt anybody, but she's pissed. And when she's pissed, she's going to go after the people that did her wrong. And as we, you said, it was a revenge tale. I believe that the movie needed the revenge tale to work, and I, need, I, know, I believe that you needed to cheer for her to get these people back. It could not be, oh, she happened to get them back. I was willing to say, you needed to get behind that, you needed to want justice to happen and need satisfaction when it did. She does really enjoy the face plant through the glass, though. She I mean, does. Let's be she honest. Does. Um, next question. Uh, being a dramatist, and I wonder if you could talk about how you ended up making movies as your way of being a dramatist. I am so lucky. Um, I quickly started out as a kid uh, cartooning. And I had a little Super 8 camera, and I would draw cartoons, and I would film them, and was very obsessive about just telling stories. I used to make stories for my friends, give out books all the time, and uh, came to the University of Chicago, was very lucky to study history and English and the core, and just learned as much as I could. I'm so glad I did that. Moved to Japan for a couple years, photographed all through Southeast Asia. Um, just, and I, because I was in, I did learn to speak Japanese, but I didn't a lot of the time understand what the hell was going on. I would just watch people in all the different countries I went to with my camera and I learned visual language, right? The universal language. So then I applied to Columbia and NYU and they said, you have to write an, an essay about your, yourself. And so then I just wrote this crazy essay um, about my family history, which is fascinating and crazy. I mean, not fascinating that I think I'm important, but when I started sharing with my friends, they're like, oh my God, that's crazy um, and interesting. And so, I had these stories to tell, and then I was lucky to go to Columbia grad school, which is great, and I took three years of acting, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was terrible at it. I thought I was great, until I would put my scene up, and my teacher was like, what did you tell them? Like, <laughs> and, then, and then eventually she was like, oh, now I know what you told them, and that's wrong. And then we finally, I kept getting actors in, and I just kept making mistakes, and, but I had an inherent talent, and quickly it got very, I got very good at it, and then I went to Sundance, which I have to give a shout out to, uh, Robert Redford has done extraordinary things in our country and now in the world in taking people like me who have a little bit of talent, a big story to tell, and giving us the tools to tell it. So then I went there and I got to work with Kathy Bates and I got to work with Frank Pearson, who sadly died uh, recently. Uh, he wrote Dog Day Afternoon, he wrote Cool Hand Luke. Um, I just got to interface with other artists who loved film the way I loved film and taught me how to love it and how to be better at it. So that's the general. Then there's a million ways that one gets better at being a dramatist. If anybody here wants to be anything in the world, I would just say do it, do it, do it, do it. Do it badly and then do it better. I mean, it's, it's the only way. And that was you know, how I just got better and better as a filmmaker. At what point, if indeed you've reached that point, in trying to get a project going in Hollywood, did uh, discrimination against women as directors uh, 
go away or is it still present? And how do you, give us this anecdote about how you've overcome that kind of thing. How you overcome sexism? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you take some bullets and you just keep walking. Um, you know, it's there. I, I, think, I don't think anybody would say it's not there. 4% of us work, which is extinction level. It's not enough to, to have a career. So every time, I, every time a woman makes a movie, it's an extraordinary thing because it's a miracle against the odds. And so you have to say, thank God that they're made, right? And yet I want everybody to work, but I'd like to see women work more. Um, how does one deal with it? I mean, it happens, you know, and sometimes you, the, some guy's being sexist and you're, you know, on the other end of it and you're realizing it and he's not. You know, maybe he's talking to, as happened recently, a guy who has some power that he probably shouldn't have and some, you know, opportunity. He's kind of bragging to a group of women. We're sitting there, and, and I'm, I'm including, uh, there's a double Oscar winner that I hired who's standing there, you know, listening to this conversation, and he's, he's bragging about how easy it is and how he really doesn't have to do a lot and everybody does all the work for him, and he's proud of that. Well, you say that to a bunch of women who probably never had a day when somebody was doing the work for them and they were doing it for other people, and you realize he doesn't even realize that that's offensive to these women who are so professional and so brilliant and working so hard. Uh, what do you do there? Do you say something to him? Nah, you get together with the other women and you just say, have you had that conversation before? Yeah, I had. And that's too bad. And you think, well, that's part of it. Or, I don't know, you walk in on a boys club and uh, for me, I don't, I don't point it out. It's more, I, I just understand it's just part of where we are as a culture. And I don't, I mean, look, I think you can blame certain people, but I think you're just, it's where we're at. And then, then you meet a lot of guys who, for as many guys as you meet like that, I think that you meet more nowadays who are super cool, are gender blind, who think women are great, think men are great. And it's the same way I think that you meet people who are colorblind, and then you meet people who are racist. And I think you just, in a lifetime, I think you tolerate it. It's, you tolerate it and yet you try to make change by, hopefully you yourself, whatever your difference is, I'm a Jew, I'm a woman, I'm gay, whatever. You just try to do the best job you can because you do know that that makes a difference. I don't know. Um, I, uh, you had mentioned um, when you had actors that you really liked that were willing to be in your film, you expanded their role. I was just curious, during the filming process, how uh, much do they, are they involved in the collaboration? Like if they're in a scene and they're like, I don't know that this would really work or do you really feel like you have a clear vision and there isn't that give and take so much? Well, I mean, I'm lucky that I have a very clear vision of what I want to do, but I'm also very lucky that I love the collaborative process. And what I find is when very talented people get together, something better results and it is truly a miracle. So hopefully I have a really clear vision and then that actor comes in and then they have something new to add or anybody has something new to add and my vision gets even clearer because they're so talented. And that to me is, that's the greatest thing. The worst thing is I have a clear vision and the other person doesn't see it, or you know what I mean, Ho hopefully, or maybe I'm wrong, then they teach me I'm wrong. But I just find that the actors, Julianne made up a great line. I don't know, we were in ADR and we, there was a scene, this always happens, you know, additional okay, dialogue ADR. replacement. ADR? Additional dialogue replacement. Oh, sorry, at the end of a movie, I mean, I love sound. So at the end of the movie, you know, you've got some pockets where you tried writing some lines, they were all stupid, you know, they didn't work. The movie's being finished and you've got a little gap there. We're here. There it is, right? And you're like, you're, you're, you're finishing the movie and you're like, what the fuck did, what the hell did we say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What the hell did we say? And then you remember what you, somebody reads the lips and they're like, you said blah, blah, blah. And you're like, that's really boring, right? And then you're in the, on the stage and you're like, can we come up with something better? And you come up with 20 lines. You're like, why don't you say this? And why don't you say that? And you can just feel it's really bad. And then if you're a brilliant actress like Julianne, she's like, oh, I have an idea. And she says something. And it's better than any other idea you had, but you're all honest and you're like, great. So that's the, the collaborative process is, you know, you guys should all read a book, uh, Name Above the Title, if you, if you love the movie business. Have you read that? Mm -hmm. It is one of the most entertaining books. It's Frank Capra's Wars with Cohen. Uh, but they talk about, you remember the, the joke room? How you build a comedy is you try to top each other. So I tell part of the joke and I run out of steam. 
She's got to tell part of the joke. She runs out of steam. I tell the next part of the joke. That's collaboration. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to say uh, congratulations and thank you for being one of those very few women out there who make films because there really are so few and I'm so happy for the few that there are and I hope there will be more. <laughs> Um, and then I want to ask a question that is maybe a bit difficult for the end, but um, it sort of links up with what I'm writing about in my uh, graduate degree thesis, and it's about uh, the interrelation between uh, violence and sexuality, because we have been speaking a lot about violence, but not so much about how it links up with sexuality, and especially in your movies I see that very strongly, and I wanted to ask you what you think about that. What do I think about oh. sex and violence? Yeah, no, just what ideas you, you have to share on the subject because your film seems and so much about that. the connection between the two in your films, yeah. I mean, again, I think sexuality is one of our most human, if we're going to talk about human traits, characteristics, right? I mean, not that we all desire sexuality, but say most of us desire sexuality, have a sexual orientation or sexual preferences. In a lifetime, they may change. Sex is procreation. I mean, sex is so vital to us. I believe strongly that, that violence is vital to us. People may differ with me. Um, I certainly see an, a sad and, look, the downside of sexuality and violence is, I mean, you talk about women, you know? There's a, an alarming rate of sexual violence against women. And it's heartbreaking because women can be physically weaker than, than men and therefore they are gonna be the objects of that sexual, that sexual abuse. I think it's alarming that you know, the sexual abuse that happens to kids. I think it's alarming the sexual abuse that happens to, to women in general. So that we see a lot of. But on the other side, you know, there's a lot of healthy violence in sexuality, right? I think there's BDSM. I think there's a lot of people, us, you know, enjoy a level of maybe it's coercion, maybe it's violence, maybe it's power in our sexuality. And I also don't want to be the voice of violent, only vi violence is only bad because I think you know, between adults, consensual force in sexuality is a great thing. So I just, I want to kind of keep the debate real, very specific and, and true to our humanity. I mean, I just, but if there's something specific to ask, I mean, that's such a general, maybe somebody has something more, that's such a general response, but that's how I feel. Oh, well, let's go to another question. I have a question. <laughs> I think we can get in a couple more questions. Yeah, I mean, I have I the have time. I don't know if they need the theater. Hi, Kim. I was wondering if you felt any restrictions while making Carrie, since you're working with a precedent of having the Stephen King book. There is a film that came before, the Brian De Palma film, and um, the idea that a horror film in October should be sort of a blockbuster. Did you feel any of that when you were actually making Carrie? Yeah, I definitely did. Uh, not from Stephen King, not from the fact that there was a prior film, but from the fact which I believe is a very safe thing to say, I'm working in a studio system that um, there's a certain amount of money spent on movies and those movies not only need to make their money back, they need to make back their advertising costs. And that's big, that, you know what I mean? That's a lot of money that's being spent. A lot of jobs are on the line and absolutely, as a director working in the system, you are getting all kinds of feedback and you have concerns, you wanna make their money back or you won't work again. And so there are concerns about what a four quadrant movie, how it will appeal to people, how you make that something that people will like. And I think any director will admit to that. And the, the real issue I think is we're all under those constraints and I feel, it's funny when I watch my scenes again and I know, oh, I got that much money and I didn't get this much money, I got this and that. I knew everything I didn't get that I wanted but I, I kind of feel like your job is to be the best general in the world and to extract as many resources from them as you can, make the best use of those resources, and push, for me, to, to push the edge as much as I can, but you're going to hit up against limitations, and then you gotta talk your way through it. And you can usually talk a little bit more out of it, but you make a studio movie, there are limitations. Okay, we have one more question here. When you're ever, um, when you're in the beginning of your thought process and creative um, process, and you're not completely sure where you're going with something, do you ever feel pressured into um, a dialogue um, about your artwork or about your, your films? And if so, how do you work around that to explain your creative ideas? Help me understand the question, because I, I, I think it's an important question. So yeah. do I feel frustrated with my own creativity? When you're, when you're starting out, like when you're, when you're taking apart the engine to put it back together. Right. 
Um, do you ever run into into question into people questioning you before you're ready to um, give uh, to give dialogue about your your work? Do you ever run you into issues? You mean like in the people who are employing me or the press? Both. And how well, do you the press isn't that? really involved in my process when I'm in this kind of cone. Though actually, they kind of are. Like they were interviewing me when I was doing Carrie, but. I would say more the people I'm working with, yes. There is never enough time, there's never enough money, ever. So basically, yes, meaning people are pressuring me for the answer, and the answer is not, it's not possible to have the answer. It's like right now, I take an ax and I break this table, and you immediately say, how are you gonna fix it, Kim? And I say, well, I need a moment to look at the damage and to see what I can do. They're not gonna give you that moment, so that's where you're being a good general. You create a space for yourself, and I would say, to either the young artist or the working artist, solution, solution, solution. Don't get stymied in the not doing. Start fixing it. Okay, I'm gonna try it with glue. Okay, that didn't work. Okay, I'm gonna try it with a, a, a staple gun. That didn't work. Okay, I'm gonna build a new table. Okay, that didn't work. I find running solutions as quickly as possible. Okay, this scene is not working. Let me put it on its feet and let me try it this way. Let me try it that way. I am definitely a believer in Try it different ways because the minute it works, you can move on. So that would be my. I think we are. Oh, we've got one more here. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on that, the kind of matrilineal frame that you added to Carrie, beginning with the birth scene and then ending with Carrie sort of sparing the last girl because of the fact that she's pregnant. Well, I felt really, really strongly that this was a, a mother daughter story in its heart and soul. And that was the thing that I fought the most to bring up. And I love that this was a woman who was, Margaret was ambivalent about this thing inside of her, about Carrie as a being, and that she saw her as potentially evil because she represented her own sexuality and herself. And I thought, wow, what a weight for Carrie to carry, to literally carry through her lifetime, that her mother was ambivalent about her own existence, her own humanity. So I wrote that opening scene. I changed the fight at the end where they have a fight to the death. And I had to shoot it in six hours, so I don't know, you guys probably don't know what a movie schedule is like, but that's like doing this interview in five minutes. So they're like, you have six hours and you have one wall. And I was like, what are you kidding? I can shoot a, a, a fight scene with one angle. So thank God I had the amazing Carol Spear who does production design for David Cronenberg. She gave me three walls. So I got one wall, one wall, one wall. Um, so. Basically, with very limited resources, I was expanding that mother story everywhere I could. Now, the choice to put Sue at the end um, was there when I came onto the project. And I've always been unsure hmm. about whether Sue should be there at the end, but I was willing to try it because I saved a Jarden, I killed the mother, and I did that because Carrie has to kill her mother. That, that's where the climax has to be. And it would, it's possibly redundant to kill Desjardins first. And I thought, this is coming to the human monster. I love the Terminator. I love Frankenstein. I, I love monsters. And I thought, if Carrie realizes that she is a human monster and realizes that she ought to die having killed her mother, then she can kill her with total passion and she can regret it. And with the last bit of energy that she has, rather than save herself, she could save somebody else. That to me felt very interesting in terms of a completion of Carrie's character. And I think history will tell. We'll look back and we'll say, was that the right choice? I, I think it's an interesting one. Um, so just to close out very quickly, let's look forward a bit, because your reel makes it clear you can do anything, you know, action film, love story. What are you working on next? Can you tell us about one project you're excited about? I can tell you about one that I'm writing, but I have to see if I can get it out there. It's, uh, I'm fascinated with the singularity is near. I'm fascinated with creating a human mind. I am amazed at where we are going with augmentation of the human body. Mm -hmm. We are going to be two separate species at some point. Uh, and either way, people who are crippled and, and are rebuilt are going to be the first to benefit from this technology. So yeah. I helped somebody die. Um, I helped my father die um, not too long ago. And I, but I was in hospice. And I can tell everybody, if you have a chance to be involved with hospice, it is one of the most miraculous things ever. You will see dying as living. Dying is always hard. But it really occurred to me that we we're gonna be chopping people's heads off and essentially giving them new bodies and sustaining them. And so that's the real. The unreal is that I've written a, a really, I think, wonderful story 
about a guy who was put into that position. He works for the military, and he's in the military industrial complex, and that happens to him, and it's about coming back to his humanity as he's lost many, many things that we would say make him human, mm -hmm. but he's desperate to hold on to it. So that's something that, I, that I'm going to do, and then I'm going to do a TV pilot. Well, that sounds great. <laughs> TV? Yeah. It was such a pleasure to talk with Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. for all your Thank questions. You.